a few months ago, uh, there was an announcement that uh, Radley was leaving the Washington Post. <clears throat> and um, if you've been following wrongful convictions for the last decade, um, you of course know who Radley is. And so I immediately sent an email uh, and said, Radley, I've been chasing you for years. You've written about John Thompson, whom I've written about. We've never actually spoken, but I am only more and more and more of a fanboy um, as I read the stuff that you write. So um, could you please give me a call? Because if you're a freelancer, I want to solve that problem for you. Um, and Radley, of course, already had, had uh, created some plans for doing things as, uh, as we'll talk about. But um, uh, and you, if you're not subscribing to his Substack, uh, you should, because it, Radley's doing what Radley has done for the last decade, which is, or more, which is to churn out the most thoughtful, uh, most insightful, uh, long form and short form pieces on um, the absurdities, the mistakes, the errors, and the need for improvement in the criminal justice system uh, of anybody in the country, frankly. So um, he did, he's done that for Reason, he's done that for Slate, he's done that for the Washington Post. Um, <clears throat> he's been cited in two Supreme Court opinions. Uh, he's been cited in three federal appellate decisions and by the Mississippi Supreme Court. Um, he's been uh, responsible for the release of somebody from death row, uh, for the commutation of a sentence, of a life sentence, uh, for other substantive reforms. Um, his work has really had an impact. Um, I regularly use his material in my teaching. If you haven't read his five-part uh, story in the Washington Post on bite marks, which completely eviscerates that entire field of junk science with, you know, absolutely <laughs> impossible to ignore logic and depth and precision. It's a kind of reporting that um, we just don't see in enough places. Um, and so uh, when I reached out to, to Radley and said, hey, we need a journalism fellow, and he said, what's that? And I said, I don't know, I'm making it up, but will you do it? <laughs> Um, so we're, we're kind of figuring that out as we go. Um, he's also the author of two books, Rise of the Warrior Cop, The Militarization of America's Police Forces, and The Cadaver King and the Country Dentist, A True Story of Injustice in the American South. He's won a host of writing awards, as you might expect, uh, and so it's a real thrill to have him here today. Um, and I want to welcome Radley Dacco. Let me just do the format. Okay. So, so, so Radley's going um, Radley's to talk for, I don't know, 10 minutes, let's say. Sure. Um, and then um, we're going to open it up for questions. I've got a bunch. We've talked about things we might want to talk about. Unlike downstairs with all the cards, we don't want to make people wander through the tables. So we'll just do a more relaxed raise your hand and, and I'll call on you format. And then uh, when you ask the question, give me a second to repeat it for the folks that are uh, following along online. And uh, then we'll go from there. Okay? Uh, thanks, John. Uh, thanks for the extremely generous in introduction. and. Um, to point out how generous, as I'll get to in a minute, I was actually fired by the Washington Post. Uh, he, he, John, <laughs> that's not my story. Graciously said, I, I left, um, and I'll talk about that in this. Um, so um, I felt the easiest way to do this, just because this is a, a talk about the state of journalism and how to, as it applies to the criminal justice system. Uh, I was going to track my own sort of career and ideological arc um, in these ten or so minutes, and then we'll, we'll go to questions from that. Um, so I grew up in Indiana um, in a very rural, um, extremely white uh, county uh, just east of Indianapolis, uh, extremely conservative. Um, and if you know me or my work, you know, I give you an idea. When I was senior in high school, I was the, the president of this youth organization that did put on events with the sheriff's department and had these uh, very sort of close relations with the deputies uh, in Hancock County, which given what I do now is sort of interesting. Um, I went to uh, Indiana University. Um, and I kind of grew up in this very politically conservative area um, of Indiana, didn't have a lot of exposure to the world. Uh, that helped at Indiana, which is a huge public school, obviously. Um, but when I got out, I went to work for this very sort of right-wing nonprofit organization in D.C., um, where they kind of scared the hell out of me, and um, that's where I discovered that I might be um, libertarian-ish, uh, more than conservative. Um, I. Did not, I was not happy there at all, so I did what most people do in their 20s when they're unhappy with their jobs, which is I went to law school. Um, and um, after about a year of law school, I was looking at a lot of debt. Um, I should add, I always knew I wanted to be a writer. I was just couldn't figure out how I was going to make a living doing that. Um, so after a year of law school, uh, I was looking at a lot of debt, and with a lot of debt, it meant I was going to have to practice somewhere and probably put in sort of backbreaking hours at a big firm, and that's not what I wanted to do. Uh, so I dropped out of law school and took a job with the dot-com. Um, it's kind of a story of a lot of failures getting here, actually. But um, 
Um, but actually, looking back on it, I think it was, I think I, I'm glad I went to law school for one year and I'm glad that I quit because those first year classes have been really valuable to the work that I do now. Just sort of having an understanding of con constitutional law and criminal procedure um, has been really important. Um, so I worked for a dot-com in, uh, I went to Wash U in St. Louis for the year of law school and I worked for this dot-com just outside of St. Louis. Uh, and it was this is 99, so this is the peak of the kind of dot-com excesses in this place. It was in this building that locals called the Taj Mahal because it was sort of grand. And, um, and you know, when I, when I started work, I, my job was basically to, uh, you know, surf the early internet and write articles about the cool things I found. Um, and um, by the time I ended, uh, my little company was the only company left in the entire building because uh, everybody else had gone bankrupt. And there's actually, we had a map that we kept on the wall showing which bathrooms were left that weren't completely disgusting, that were still usable because obviously the janitorial staff had all been laid off. So we're in this giant grand building that was locally referred to as the Taj Mahal, um, and yet it was kind of the, the, uh, the epitome of kind of dot com, of the dot com bust. Um, not to belabor the point too, point too much, but one of my favorite stories is we had, as things were starting to crumble, um, we still had a suite at the uh, St. Louis Blues for the St. Louis Blues games. Uh, the executives had a suite, and you know, if you were a, a plebe employee, there's a rotating uh, schedule where you know every so many months you could go to a game in the suite. And I was in the suite, you know, it was catered and open bar, and I remember sort of hearing rumors that thing, the wheels were starting to come off. And at one point, they brought the dessert cart through after the, the main buffet and the, the vice president that was there told, quietly sort of pulled the guy aside and told him to take the uh, dessert car away because we're on a little bit of a budget right now. Um, so that's how I knew things were not going to go well from there. Um, anyway, uh, as my company started falling apart, um, I saw an opening at the Cato Institute in Washington, D.C. At this point, um, uh, you know, I, I uh, admired the work that Cato had done on issues like immigration and the drug war, and those were issues I was interested in, so I applied for this job, and um, eventually I ended up doing public policy for them, uh, covering civil liberties. Um, and this is kind of how I got into this beat. Um, so, you know, at that time, I knew that I was opposed to the drug war. Uh, you know, I knew I had a uh, sort of healthy, you know, libertarian skepticism of authority and, and uh, law enforcement. Um, but it was sort of covering the drug war and particularly covering uh, SWAT raids and no-knock raids that um, really kind of got me interested in speed or making this kind of my, my career. Um, I just read story after story after story that just made me angry. I was just furious at watching, you know, the, the way that some people were being treated by the criminal justice system. Um, I remember reading local news, I ended up writing a paper for Cato about SWAT raids and paramilitarized police, which kind of preceded the warrior cop book. I just remember, you know, you'd read local, local article after local article about one of these raids gone wrong. And at the end, inevitably, they would quote somebody from the police department who would say, you know, this is an isolated incident. This almost never happens. And um, you start to read about enough isolated incidents, and you start to wonder how isolated they really are. Um, and so that led to kind of a larger interest in the criminal justice system just beyond the drug war. Um, and kind of slowly since then, um, my career has been a... Um, uh, kind of a, a, a slow motion um, career long debunking of everything I thought I believed growing up in a conservative town in Indiana. Um, uh, you know, to the point where, you know, I ended up writing a, a piece for the Washington Post that's kind of become an archive page, although since I left they haven't been updating it, on where I just kind of documented every single academic study about racism in the criminal justice system. Um, and. Um, the story that kind of got me my break in journalism then from Cato was in, in researching these raids, I, I happened upon, I think it was, it was, either I found a local news story or I may have found a, a court filing about it, but a case named, a guy named Corey May in Mississippi. Um, so Corey May uh, was 21 years old, had just moved into this duplex with his girlfriend and their 18 month old daughter. Um, on the other side of the duplex, there was a guy who was a known drug dealer and it was clear this was the guy the police were after. But they either didn't know it was a duplex or didn't care, and they raided both sides of the duplex at about 12.30 in the morning. Uh, Corey wakes up uh, with his daughter. His, his wife was working the midnight shift at a fact, uh, chicken factory. Um, wakes up to the sound of people trying to break into his house. Uh, the door flies open. Officer comes in. Uh, Corey didn't know it was a cop. He fires two shots uh, and then immediately surrenders uh, and kills the officer. Um, 
He was immediately arrested, uh, pretty severely beaten, um, taken to one jail, and then at the last minute they took him to another jail because they were afraid he was going to be lynched. Um, and he ends up being convicted of um, capital murder and the intentional killing of a police officer. And when I find the case, he had been sentenced to death and was still on death row. Uh, so I started writing about it on my blog, actually, at the time. This was about 2005, 2004. Um, and it kind of went viral and got a lot of attention. Um, Corey had no prior criminal record. You know, there was you know, the police version of events. You, to believe the police, you had to believe that this guy who had no criminal record was home with his 18-month-old daughter, was asleep, woke up. Uh, realized that the people breaking down his door were police, decided to take them on with his handgun and the few bullets that were inside, you know, fired uh, about half of those bullets and then surrendered with bullets still left in the gun. You know, none of that really made sense. The, 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 the you know, the Occam's razor uh, narrative of what happened was that he woke up, somebody was breaking into his house, he was scared as hell, uh, fired, and then when the police, he realized they were police, he immediately surrendered. Um, so it got a lot of attention, uh, brought a big firm, Covington and Burling, a big, um, big law firm came aboard and gave him pro, pro bono defense. And eventually, uh, by I think it was 2012, um, the uh, prosecutors, the new prosecutor, uh, agreed to let him plead guilty to manslaughter, uh, and he got time served, so he got out after 10 years. Um, and when I tell the story, um, you know, the thing about Corey's story, it, it got me kind of my break in journalism. Um, it, it is in some ways a happy ending because, you know, this guy got out of prison and he's doing great now. And, but, you know, in other, in other ways, it, it just struck me as really perverse and absurd that this is one of the happy endings, right? This is a guy who police broke into his home in the middle of the night for, an, you know, what is a consensual uh, nonviolent crime that he also happened to be innocent of. Um, they put him in this horrible position where he has to choose if these people breaking into his house are, are criminals there to do him harm or police there who might be there by mistake. Uh, he makes the wrong call, which police do in these raids all the time and are rarely held accountable for it. Uh, and for that, the state spends the next 10 years trying to kill him. Uh, and because after 10 years, the state agreed to let him plead to a different felony, which will follow him around for the rest of his life, uh, but he does generously, they do generously agree to let him come home, this is kind of the story we celebrate as a happy ending. Um, and to me, that more than anything kind of illustrates the absurdity of, of this system. And it's kind of guided my thinking about how I, I approach these stories ever since. Um, just the kind of low standards and expectations we have for the system that's supposed to be administering justice. Um, so I was at Reason Magazine, a libertarian magazine, for a few years. Um, and I'm gonna, I don't want to go on too many tangents, but I think there's a, a great example. When I was at Reason, you know, Reason's a, a, it's kind of the flagship libertarian magazine. Um, has a, you know, uh, a, it's, it's, you know, I think, I think it, it, it's a good magazine. It does what it does very well, uh, but it has a very low circulation rate, um, and, uh, and um, you know, it has a bigger online presence now. But when I was there, you know, it wasn't that widely read of a magazine. And I remember there was a case I was writing about in Louisiana. Um, this is a little bit of a tangent, but I think it's notable. Um, where this guy had been convicted uh, under a shaken baby syndrome, right, um, a really controversial diagnosis. And the guy who, the medical examiner who basically pr provided the testimony that sent this guy away was this guy named Stephen Hain in Mississippi who I'd been writing about for about 20 years now. Um, uh, he passed away a couple years ago. But Hain, Hain did about 90% of the autopsies in Mississippi over a 20-year period. He was doing well over 2,000 autopsies per year at one point, uh, which is just absurd. Um, and he, he, he was monopolized this private referral autopsy system in Mississippi because he was able to tell prosecutors what they wanted to hear. And so he would get the next referral as long as he gave them the information that they wanted. Anyway, it's a crazy story. That's what my second book is about. Um, but I remember there was this case where this guy was convicted. And, and the Fifth Circuit, um, in this guy's case, finally, after you know, 15 years of people challenging Hain as an expert witness and pointing out all the ways that he's crazy and, and has given these, these completely implausible diagnoses, there was one case where the prosecutor thought that, uh, the prosecutor's theory was that this brother and his sister had teamed up to kill the sister's husband, and neither of them could do it alone, so they waited until the husband was asleep, and they held the gun at the same time and simultaneously pulled the trigger. Which, you know, may, maybe that happened, maybe it didn't, but Hain testified at this kid's trial that he could tell by the bullet wounds in the body that two people were holding the gun that fired the bullets, right? And it was upheld. The judge, the judge wouldn't even grant a Daubert hearing on it. He thought it was so obvious what this medical examiner was saying. Anyway, um, Hain did the autopsy in Corey May's case, um, and I won't get into what he said there, but it wasn't particularly credible. But I started looking into all this, 
Anyway, back to this guy who gets convicted of, under shaken baby syndrome. So Hain gave that testimony. And after all these years of people challenging Hain, finally the Fifth Circuit says, acknowledges that this medical expert has been discredited, right? But at the same time, they deny relief to this guy because they say, uh, you, you know, under, under EDPA, you have one year to bring your claim after you could have reasonably discovered new evidence of your innocence. Well, they say, well, people have been saying Hain is, is, is you know, uh, not credible for 15 years. Why didn't you? You should have brought it way before that. And of course, lots of people did, and that very same court shot them down. And in fact, the same court shot somebody down less than a year earlier. Um, but the thing, the reason I bring it up and the reason I, I found it darkly amusing is the first citation that the Fifth Circuit put out as to why uh, this guy who was, pro, who was representing himself from sitting in a prison cell in Angola, that he should have read this article in Reason magazine in 2005 or 2006 that I had written, uh, and that should have prompted him to bring this challenge against Stephen Hayne. Anyway, um, that was one of the first times I'd ever been cited by a court, and it was uh, uh, <laughs> mixed emotions, obviously. Um, uh, so, so from there, I went to the Huffington Post um, and kind of did the same thing. I, I, I um, had a blog where I would sort of critique the criminal justice system, but then I would also do long-form reporting um, and did some stuff there that I'm, I'm really proud of, including a long piece about Hain and Scam Michael West in Mississippi. Um, and then after my uh, first book came out about the police militarization, um, the Washington Post was trying to expand their opinion section to include sort of investigative reporting. Um, and so they asked me to come over. And so I ran a blog there called The Watch. Um, which, you know, again, was sort of daily commentary on the criminal justice system, but then I would also do these long-form reports. Um, really proud of the work I did there. Um, I was the first person to do uh, an in-depth piece about the municipal courts in St. Louis County um, and how they were uh, basically, you know, oppressing uh, mostly black people in those counties with uh, these fines and fees that would then fund these city councils. And, you know, it was a great example of structural uh, or systemic racism because the reason you had, there were, I think there are almost 100 municipalities in St. Louis County, uh, and some of them are just tiny. In fact, you can stand on the lawn of one city hall in St. Louis County and see two other city halls uh, from where you're standing. Um, and each of these places has their own police department, or most of them do, and their own city council. And they fund this basically through fines and fees. And so the poorer the, the municipality you're living in, the more likely it is that it's entirely funded by fines and fees which are being imposed by the, on the poor people who live in those places. Um, and this is what, you know, kind of drove what happened in Ferguson or a lot of the outrage and anger had been this pent up frustration and anger at this system. Um, and the reason why you have so many municipalities is white flight from St. Louis, right? White people would move out to the suburbs, black people would follow, so white people would move a mile over and create a whole new city. Uh, and this just happened over and over again all over St. Louis County. Um, in any case, um, I did a lot of work there I was really proud of. I did a, a, a piece on uh, no-knock search warrants in Little Rock that were, I found that almost all of them, um, almost every warrant in, no, in Little Rock was being served with a no-knock raid and was illegal um, in the way that they were procured and that police were abusing the informant system. Um, and that became an issue in the mayoral election and, and the, the city elected a mayor who then reformed that system. I think they went from 70 or 80 no-knocks per year to I think three in the, in the last couple of years total. Um, so I was really you know, proud of the work I did there. Unfortunately, the kind of the media la journalism landscape changed while I was at the Post, um, and the Post moved more toward one being kind of more frequent, uh, what, you, what we in the journalism business uh, derisively call hot takes. Um, they wanted kind of instant short reactions to things that were going on in the news, which isn't really why I, I went into journalism. It wasn't what I enjoy doing. Frankly, it's not what I'm particularly good at. Um, and uh, so eventually that kind of led to the Post. Uh, it, it kept taking longer and longer for my stories to get published because the Post wasn't dedicating those kinds of resources. Now, I will say I was on the opinion side, and the opinion, it was the opinion side that didn't want the long-form journalism I was doing, and they hired me to do. Um, on the news side, which is very distinct and separate, uh, you know, I think Post still does amazing investigative journalism. They do really good work. Um, I'm not meaning to disparage the whole publication. Uh, but then, you know, there was just kind of a personality clash and a disagreement. So uh, finally, this came to a head um, last year, and um, I left the Post. And, uh, you know, it was a pretty harrowing decision. I mean, if you're a journalist working at the Washington Post, kind of getting to choose your own articles, um, choose what stories you pursue is sort of a dream job, right? Um, but it wasn't really until I got fired that I realized, um, you know, how 
much the landscape had changed. I'd been there for about 10 years. It sort of changed underneath me, and, and frankly, how kind of miserable I was, because while in theory this was my dream job in practice, it wasn't really working out that way. Um, so uh, to give you kind of a, so to bring everything kind of to present, um, you know, at the same time you have this move that a lot of journalists are making toward kind of working for themselves. Um, and so Substack uh, had been around for a couple of years at that point. Um, so I launched my own Substack. Uh, and so at this point, um, uh, it was kind of, my wife and I were driving across country uh, on the day I launched it and the day I kind of announced my firing. And I'll be honest, I, I used, you know, I knew people would be upset about the firing, so I announced both the firing and my Substack in, in the same tweet, right? So, um, uh, yeah, you do what you got to do, right? Um, and, um, you know, my wife and I were driving across country at the time, and it was just sort of hitting refresh on my Substack over and over again, you know, watching. Thankfully, the numbers go up and like, you know, okay, are we going to be all right? I think we're going to be all right. Because, of course, stupidly, it also, you know, made a huge investment right before I realized I was going to get fired. Um, so, um, you know, at this point, I've, I've got enough subscribers that to pay for about 80% of what I was making at the Post. Um, so, you know, I've made up a lot of my salary. I hope, hopefully, that will continue to go up. Um, I also can freelance, you know, for other places now, which I couldn't do at the Post. So, you know, I can write for other audiences and... Um, it's, um, you know, it's been gratifying. Um, I kind of made this joke on Twitter, but it was, I never would have thought that sort of getting fired would be as good for my self-esteem as it was, because it was sort of like I was feeling very unappreciated at the Post, and here, like, now I'm supported by my own readers, and I have a lot more freedom. Um, you know, you do need editors. I'm, I'm not a journalist who claims he doesn't need editors. I welcome editors. I love editors. I love fact-checkers. They save my butt over and over and over again. Um, so that's one thing I'm, you know, hopefully at some point I'll have enough subscribers I can hire an independent editor. Um, for the, until then, my uh, brilliant and lovely wife, who's a um, journalist and uh, amazing journalist in her own right, but an even more amazing editor, or an equally amazing editor, um, <laughs> way better editor than I am, um, uh, has been taking on those, those duties um, uh, and, uh, you know, this has made all of my stuff a lot better. So, uh, but hopefully, you know, uh, my goal is to get to the point where um, I can hire uh, editors, at least on a freelance for a project by project basis. Um, but you know, I'm doing work I, I love. I'm very proud of a, a lot of the stuff I've already done. Um, my first Substack piece, um, just to boast a little, uh, about this wrongful conviction in Arkansas, which is really one of the most horrible, heartbreaking cases I've ever written or covered, um, uh, is a finalist for a Silver Gavel Award from the ABA. Um, and I've got a piece going up probably next week um, on ballistics um, matching, sort of forensic firearms analysis. Um, that's uh, about 10 to 12,000 words. We'll see when my wife gets done with it how long it is. Um, but uh, I, that I'm very excited about also. Um, so I, I don't know. That's a kind of a summary of how I got to where I am here. And um, I'll chat with John now and then hopefully with some of you. <laughs> well, yeah, well, well deserved. Um, well, let me, let me do the most important thing first, which is Radley Balco at Substack.com. <laughs> that's right. So if you haven't written that down again, you should, um, because, you know, as, as Radley indicated, there's some really fascinating stuff that he's already doing uh, on that and will continue to do. Um, so I, I should say it's free. You don't have to subscribe to read the articles, because I want the point of writing stuff is so people read it. Um, but, you know, you can subscribe if you like you what you read and want to sub support it. <laughs> right. But all good people do. <laughs> um, so, um, I, you know, I was struck by one thing you said because it's very similar to, to my sort of, you know, origin story into criminal justice reform. You, you've written about John Thompson, uh, the exonerator from New Orleans, and, and I had written a book about John in the late 2000s, and I was um, shopping it around, and I kept getting people who would say to me, this is a great proposal, this is a, a great story. Um, we see a lot of these, and so, you know, we're not sure that it's a, it's a book, but, but thank you and keep, keep going. And I was like, well, hold on. You see a lot of stories about a guy who was incarcerated for 18 years in death row and like weeks before his execution it was discovered that he actually didn't commit the crime and they're like, yeah, we get about two of these a month. Maybe take it to the New Yorker. <laughs> and I, I was sort of astonished, right? And to your, to your point about when you keep hearing it's an isolated incident and then you know, at some point it kind of trips that maybe it's not actually an isolated incident. That was my moment where I sort of had that, uh, <clears throat> had that moment. So I'm, I'm really... Um, appreciate that you then took the initiative to keep going and keep digging and do those things. Um, one of the things that you kind of find when you look at all these stories, one of the things that always struck me about wrongful convictions is it kind of makes you intellectually humble, right? You have to sort of be willing to be 
wrong because every wrongful conviction is a story where people were totally convinced of somebody's guilt and then later on we find out that it wasn't the case. So especially going from the Washington Post to someplace like Substack where, you know, I, I don't know what the fact checkers are on the opinion side of some of these places where, where you've been, but how do you take on that added responsibility of making sure that you're right about things and, and, and in a world where we're, we're kind of increasingly decentralized with the media, right, how, how do we ascertain that the facts are the facts? And I'm, I'm going to put aside the whole, like, overly politicized question about what a fact is for right now. Right. Um, well, I, the, I guess the answer is I, I take that on extremely trepidatiously. Um, I, I, you know, I, I make mistakes. I know I make mistakes, um, and so I, um, you know, there are there are people who moved to Substack because yeah, you know, they thought editors were keeping them down or whatever. And you know, I had issues. Well, I had issues with the editor who fired me at the post, but generally, I think editors, I, I welcome them. I need them. Um, so yeah, I mean, it's it's I'm double, triple checking way more. Or I don't even seven, eight times I'll, I'll check a piece before it goes up because uh, I do know I make mistakes and I, do, I, I don't have those, those sort of safeguards of having um, a, um, you know, two or three, I think at the post for the opinion side, you know, if it's a big piece, it would be, uh, it would go to a copy editor, a fact checker, my regular editor, and then we go to legal. Um, so, you know, now it's, I'm checking it three or four times and then, you know, if it's a long, if it's a big piece, my wife will check it also. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I, I I'll be very happy when I'm to the point where I can hire, you know, an editor because um, right now it's just sort of, uh, yeah, you're very nervous. You're, you're, when you post a big investigation like this that you did yourself, it's like you're very excited about getting it out there. You're also just waiting for that email, you know, and the, with, the, with the correction and the subject line, uh, sort of terrified. Um, but I mean, this is true of all all journalists. Um, my, I hope she's okay with me telling this. My wife has a joke she makes where every time she publishes a piece, she takes as her ritual shower of self-doubt um, <laughs> where she, she just hits publish and then she goes and you know worries about anything she may have gotten wrong. Um, but you know, I think I don't want to ever stop worrying about that, right? Because that's, I think, how you, you make sure that you, you get as little wrong as possible. So it's kind of an unsatisfying answer to your question. But. <laughs> well, you know, the truth sometimes is. Um, you know, I, let, me, let me ask this question. I think, you know, you've been doing this for, for 15 or more years, um, and obviously the industry has changed. Talk a little bit about how the audience has changed, right? We have a responsibility as consumers to think about how we interact with the pieces that you and other people are putting out there. And as you've gone from different forums, has your interaction with the audience changed with the new technologies? And, and you know, are, are we a better audience than we used to be? Are we worse? Like, what sort of problems, what sort of challenges do you wrestle with there? Um, you know, that's an interesting question. I mean, I think, I think, um, obviously, I think news consumers have become more um, uh, segmented, um, more partisan. Um, but I've also kind of switched from different from one forum to another. So when I was just sort of starting writing for a public audience, I had my own blog, and so that you know I was kind of writing for people, friends and family, and then that circle sort of gets bigger and bigger and bigger. But you're still writing for people who primarily sort of support you and agree with you or they wouldn't be coming to your site every day. I switched to Reason, which again is a lot of sort of preaching to the choir. Um, interesting, going to Huffington Post was, was interesting because I, you know, um, somebody who was at that time sort of vaguely associated with the right, going, writing, for, you know, I was writing about issues that people on the left would sort of agree with me on, but it was a different audience, so that was kind of interesting. Um, and then going to the Post, obviously, is this, you know, it's this massive, huge, prestigious platform. Um, but, you know, I, I, at that point, I, you know, reached the point in, my career where it's, you know, you never really read the comments um, anymore because uh, especially a place as big as the Post, it kind of selects the people who want to leave comments or... I've always the found the comments section to be the most thoughtful commentary. Yeah, that's right, yeah. <laughs> well, the most, most constructive feedback. Um, so now I'm kind of back to writing for an audience that largely agrees with me, which, you know, is nice in some ways, but also it's not nearly as stressful to read the comments or the feedback, but you're not really getting your message out and you're not, um, you know, talking to people who don't already agree with you about things, so you're not uh, affecting a lot of change unless, you know, something catches on and people start sharing it and so forth. Um, I do think that, uh, so a couple things. I think there have been a few kind of evolutions in, in how people look at criminal justice stories. I think when I first started writing about these no-knock raids and police militarization, um, 
you know, I, I, would re I would read the comments to sort of like local news articles, and they would almost all be sort of 100 percent supportive of the police. And, you know, if somebody, if the police accused somebody or if they raided somebody, and even if they shot somebody who, and didn't find any drugs, it would always be like, well, they must have been doing something wrong or the police wouldn't be there. Um, and that has changed. There's a lot more skepticism in the reaction to these stories. I think there's a little more tendency to question sort of whether these tactics are appropriate. Um, but then, you know, and that, and that continued for a long time. And then, you know, I think during the Trump era, there was this, this strange kind of thing happened where, as somebody who kind of sort of vaguely came from the right, I, had, I, thought, I felt like I had brought a lot of people, particularly libertarians, but even some conservatives, along on these issues. And there was more skepticism. You saw skepticism of SWAT raids in places like National Review and the Wall Street Journal. Um, and then the Trump administration really, like, re-segmented everyone. And so I remember the Breonna Taylor case in particular, um, uh, where you know I, I had written about her case, and then um, uh, what's his name, Daniel Cameron, the Kentucky um, Attorney General, came out and he had that press conference, and where he claimed that sort of everybody that had been, you know, telling a false story about Breonna Taylor, and that isn't really what happened, and people sort of it, it gave people who were ready to kind of not believe that she was an innocent victim, something to kind of latch on to. And it became people who I had long time, you know, long time sort of promoted my work, whose names I kind of recognize are all of a sudden like, you know, the media myths about Breonna Taylor debunked. Well, you know, it turns out uh, uh, the Kentucky Attorney General was lying about the situation, uh, and he presented it to the, presented the case to the grand jury in a very misleading way. Um, but. I remember feeling really disheartened at that moment that like these the, the, the people sort of what I would consider sort of more open-minded people on the right who had been sympathetic to this idea that the police were kind of that these these tactics were were aggressive and, and unjustified and were taking you know innocent victims were now sort of ready to just kind of you know abandon all of that very quickly because we were in this kind of hyper-partisan era um, and that really you know that I, 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 on the one hand I think the George Floyd protests have really moved the needle in terms of public opinion in ways that I never would have expected. Like, I would never would have expected that we have entire states that are banning no-knock raids. You know, if you told me that five or six years ago, I would have told you you're out of your mind. Never would have thought that we'd be actually having a debate about qualified immunity, which is something that, you know, I never would have guessed. Um, uh, but uh, there is this kind of, like, hyper-partisan divide, I think, that was starting to kind of break down, even up until after Ferguson, I think you saw more people willing to admit things like the municipal court system in St. Louis County was preying on poor people, and that's a bad thing. Um, to now, I think we're kind of, people have gone back to the respective corners, and that's been kind of disappointing. And so I guess, one, you know, one of the things that, that I've seen in the media is um, sort of a, a shift in, in labels, right? And I, you know, when the, when the Quattrone Center got started, I, I very much agree with you on the sort of libertarian front of this. And, and people would say, well, are you an innocence project? And I would say, no, we're an accuracy project, right? There, there, are, there are crimes that get committed, and those people should be held accountable. But if you haven't committed the crime, you shouldn't be held accountable. That doesn't seem like a partisan issue to me. That seems like, a, like, a, like an accuracy issue and an efficiency issue and how a system ought to operate. And, you know, Texas has been, until kind of midway through the Trump administration, Texas was a great example of that, where they actually were pretty progressive on areas of, uh, of wrongful convictions. And they have a junk science law that you can pursue in habeas. And they have a Texas Forensic Science Commission to make sure they're getting it right, and um, a lot of other sort of good reforms. And so if you've committed a crime in Texas, they're going to come down hard on you. But if not, like, it's a government overreach thing, get out of my kitchen, and, and great. And that does seem to have shifted. And, and I guess one question I have is um, uh, there are a couple things that I see in the media that kind of drive me crazy in that regard because I feel like they inject a partisan flavor in the story from the headline. Uh, and one of those is I haven't read a story about Kim Gardner or Kim Fox, the, the prosecutors in, in Cook County, Chicago, or St. Louis. Um, I don't think, I can't tell you the last time I read an, an article about one of those that, that didn't describe them as Soros funded prosecutor Kim Gardner. Yeah. Right, which is which is clearly a journalistic labeling designed to shift you to one side of what's going on. Another practice that I've seen journalists do on both sides is to always name the president who appointed a judge yeah. when describing the decision, um, with the sort of implicit assumption that that judge isn't thinking independently. And I, I'm not necessarily going to get involved in that on a case by case basis, but I'm struck by it as a tool in the media that we're then consuming. And I'm wondering if there are things that you do or don't do as you're writing, you know, that, that, that pertain to that in some way. Um, yeah, so, you know, the, the Soros-funded thing, I mean, as somebody who came from, comes from 
reason in Cato to two organizations that uh, were have fund, been funded quite a bit by the Koch brothers over the years. I, I do think there's, I don't like the both sides things, but you know, I do think there's a tendency to kind of use this shorthand of Soros funded or Koch funded to kind of tell people what they're supposed to think about this particular thing. Um, so, you know, I don't, yeah, I, I, I but I, I will also say, you know, that there have been right wing groups have been interfering. Um, not so much in DA's races, but certainly in state Supreme Court races for 20 years now. I mean, they've been, police, there's a group in Virginia that's poured hundreds of thousands, probably millions at this point, of dollars into these races, and nobody's ever, you know, said anything about it. Um, and I think that's actually even more problematic because, you know, state Supreme Court justices are supposed to be, you know, neutral or whatever. Um, whereas, you know, a DA has a, uh, is a policy-oriented position, right? You're voting for the priorities that you want, of which laws you want to be enforced. Um, as for like who appointed judges, this is going to sound like a very inconsistent or self-serving answer, but I think like I think it matters when it matters, right? I mean, I think we've had some Trump appointed judges who are ow, wacky, right? I mean, they they write opinions that read like um, read like the comment section to a blog, um, and so I think it's worth pointing out when you have that much of a um, departure from sort of normal kind of judicial the judicial Overton window, you know, the, that the opinions are supposed to fit into. Um, you know, I don't think every single case is a, a matter of, um, you know, I, I thought it was less relevant to say Obama, an Obama appointed judge versus a Bush appointed judge. Um, you know, there are probably some extremes on, on both sides. I do think we're kind of in a new era right now, and I do think it's worth pointing out that, like, I mean, there's a reason why, um, uh, you know, all of these uh, Injunctions are going to the same federal judge, and what what is it? Um, uh, what's the, is it Armadillo? Um, yeah, yeah. Uh, you know, it's because they, they know that that judge. And so I think it's worth pointing out how that that particular judge got on the bench. Um, so yeah, I mean, I think it matters when it matters, and I think I, I, I'm willing to point it out when I think it matters, and you're, you're free to disagree. Um, I will say one thing, you know, in terms of like objectivity, I'm not an objective journalist. I've never claimed to be. Um, I, I strive to be accurate. I strive to be fair. I always, you know, attempt to interview the people that I'm criticizing in an article. Um, I do think there's a place for objective journalism. I think, you know, when you're writing sort of beat coverage or breaking news, but for the most part, you know, my, my position has always been there, there's no such thing as objectivity. I mean, even if you can write in perfectly neutral language, um, you're going to be showing bias and favoritism in what stories you, you write and what stories you don't write and what you want to emphasize. And so my approach has always been more sort of what the approach magazines take, I think, to journalism and newspapers, which is that I'm biased. I admit I'm biased. As a reader, you're going to know my biases up front. Um, I'm going to be transparent about them. And then you can judge, you know, what I write after that with that in mind, you know, knowing that, that I've made myself, my, where I'm coming at this story uh, clear from the outset. Well, I, I'm going to have to say, um, you know, again, the, the, the John Thompson case uh, was there was a it was was part of a series of documentaries that CNN did called Death Row Stories, and um, I spoke in that for a second, and then I saw the the, um, the cinematography of it when it actually aired, and I was so grateful that I wasn't in the target lens of the documentarians <laughs> because their ability to control the visual images, even in the interstitials and things, was so powerful in affecting the mood of the piece that I was confident that they could have made me look. Any way they had they had wanted to, um, but I think to your point, when you when you said objective journalism, my immediate reaction was, well, I don't even know what that is. As long as you're being accurate about the facts, you're always going to have a viewpoint, or else, what's the point in, in writing the piece? Right. Yeah. Um, I just want to make an unrelated comment about John Tom because I, because it's something that always struck me about him. You know, when we hear exoneree stories, um, and I, I didn't the obituary for him, I mentioned this, but you know, we, they're always described as sort of people who are like a remarkably grace, you know, showed remarkable grace and very serene restraint and humility and, and all of this, and like they forgave their accusers. And the thing about loved about John Thompson when I first interviewed him, the first question I asked, he immediately started yelling. And at one point, he got a couple of inches away from my face. And, you know, it was a little, it was a little intimidating, frankly, uh, until I realized he wasn't yelling at me. But, I mean, John Thompson was angry. I mean, and, and it reminds me sort of when I read those initial drug raid stories, the anger that I had, like I wanted to do something about it. And he had every damn right to be angry. I mean, he, he came close to execution. I don't know, was it a half dozen times he, he had an execution? Had eight, eight different warrants. And he was, he was convicted of two separate felonies, wrongly, when he was innocent. And this is my... Well, not favorite, but <laughs> it's the most remarkable thing about a story. Um, when I wrote about uh, uh, prosecutorial misconduct in, in Louisiana, I interviewed him. When John was on death row, he played chess through the bars of his cell with a guy named Sharif Kuzan. Um, and it turns out Sharif Kuzan was innocent also. <laughs> 
And so these two guys on death row were playing chess for years between their cells, talking about how they were both innocent and what they were both going to do when they got out. I mean, I, if, you know, I, he has every right to be angry. I mean, I, I, you know, the, the idea that, like, we praise these exonerees for their humility and their ability to, like, suppress their anger, I think it, it's, it's, it's always been sort of odd to me. I mean, I, th I think they should be angry. We should be angry on their behalf. Well, I definitely think that I agree with all of the above, right? I mean, I, I'm, I'm always, um, I feel like for John, when, when he would talk to me about it, he would say, I had to get rid of my anger when I was in prison. I couldn't get through prison holding all that anger. And so I, my, my kind of playing that out with the other exonerees that I've been privileged to talk to has been that they're still keeping that mindset in as they're moving forward. And, but I agree with you, as John got out more and more and got more comfortable being out, and as he started his uh, nonprofit to help others transition as they came through, because of course there were enough exonerees in New Orleans that you actually needed a nonprofit to help them all uh, recondition, um, uh, he did get angrier and angrier. And the, the question that I'm sure he said this to you and had said it a lot of times when he was speaking was, you know, these two prosecutors deliberately fabricated evidence to get me trumped up in a capital murder charge. Why isn't that attempted murder? Yeah. Yeah. We'll wait. <laughs> right? <laughs> um, and, and so I think you're right. I think we should be, I think we should be outraged about that. And, um, and, and I hope we will continue to keep those emotions moving forward because it really is a, a travesty when it's, whether it's done intentionally or not intentionally, but particularly when it's done uh, intentionally. Um, so let me, uh, let me ask one more question and we'll turn it over to the audience. So my, my one more question is, um, you know, in 20, I'm going to call it 17, 18, um, uh, a podcast came out. We've talked about it, the, pod, the serial podcast. And it was this story about Adnan Syed. And Sarah Koenig, I thought, did a, just a terrific job with it. And I think she's done terrific work since then. Her season two, where she looked at the whole system um, you know, in, in Cleveland, was really, um, I thought, amazing. And she kind of got to the end of the Syed case. And her conclusion was kind of this, man, I, gosh, I just, I really don't know. You know, like, like I don't trust this, this. This doesn't fit well for me. But there's stuff here. And, uh, you know, that... So am I getting played? Like, I don't know. And so watching that sort of mature in the, in, the, in the more recent months and thinking about how she must feel about it and sort of these questions about was her investigation deep enough? Were there other things that she should have known? And then having this overlaid question procedurally about whether victims were getting enough of an opportunity to participate. Um, I guess I'm, I'm curious about your thoughts on that as a journalist, not necessarily on the facts of the matter, but just how you react to that as a journalist, how it affects the way you do reporting. And, and also, you know, I'm curious about podcasts and how that changes again, sort of your responsibilities as a, as a purveyor of that sort of thing. Yeah, so, um, you know, the thing about Serial I think was great. One, it, it, you know, really, I think that and making a murder um, really blew a lot of these issues open and, and they reached audience, these issues reached audiences they had never reached before and I think that's great. Um, the other thing about you know what Sarah Kane did on the first season of Serial is she, was, she, you know, she had this kind of open internal dialogue about what she was doing as a journalist, the choices she was making. I mean it was a really a kind of a radical transparency um, and I always thought that was really brave and I admired her for it. She got a lot of you know flack for it but you know she 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 aired a lot of the questions that we ask ourselves when we're doing one of these investigations and the self-doubt that you have and the, the way that you check yourself and the way you try to kind of get out of having tunnel vision and seeing, only seeing things a certain way. And, um, you know, a lot, I, I've, some of the criticism was that, you know, well, the, it, it rested on Syed's innocence and, you know, if he, he, I mean, now it seems like he probably was innocent, but if he had been guilty, then the whole show is a, 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 a hoax or a, um, but that, that's not, that's a complete misunderstanding of, I mean, that, that show was about exploring the inadequacies of the criminal justice system, the, 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 the inability of the system to give people a fair trial. And that would have been true even if he had been guilty. Um, you know, I think there's value in what, what she did with that episode. And like you said, the second episode, or the second season, I'm sorry, where they look at the criminal justice system in Cleveland, I think is, I mean, what was so brilliant about that is, you know, we write about wrongful convictions. I write about, you know, forensics misconduct, police shootings, all of that. These are all things that are, it's really difficult, or it's really, sorry, it's really easy to look at this and say, all right, yeah, that's an outrage. That's crazy. I can't believe that happened, right? Um, but that isn't where most of the 
damage and destruction of the criminal justice system happens, right? It happens, it's the routine stuff, it's the day-to-day -day stuff, it's stuff that's boring, it's not sexy, that it's really difficult to make people care about. And I think one thing that that season did really, really well is they were there for the entire year and they, they followed it and they followed cases that they weighed their way through the system and you really saw how you know, even when you have somebody who's guilty, who did what the state claimed they did, the way the system kind of chews them up and spits them out does far more damage, you know, uh, in terms of just the mass, the quantity of, of how often that happens day to day uh, than wrongful convictions do. So I, I was really, I mean, I thought that was just brilliant how they did that. It made people care about it. Um, you know, I, Podcasts in general, um, I'm working on my own podcast, so um, I'll just disclose that. Um, but, I, you know, there's, there's, I think there's really good investigative journalism out there that, that in podcast form, it's basically, you know, audio journalism. I think there's a lot of really terrible, exploitative, true crime stuff also. I also think there's not a bright line that distinguishes them necessarily. I mean, I know stuff that's on one far side of the line, and I, I can tell you stuff that's on the other side. There are also, you know, good, bona fide, credentialed journalists who do some pretty exploitative stuff. Um, there are amateur kind of podcast true crime people who have blown cases open and found, you know, new evidence. Um, you know, it's a know it when you see it sort of thing, but, you know, generally my, my rule is if I'm, I find the podcast is sort of titillating me more than informing me, um, you know, I'll move on, I'll move on to another one. Um, but, you know, it's difficult. I, I, I think, you know, it's, I think there's something about podcasts that amplify to make the kind of exploitative side seem quite a bit worse for some reason. I mean, a lot of the podcasts strike me as more like, you know, episodes of The Forensic Files or, um, you know, Cold Case or whatever, those terrible, awful shows. Um, and there's something about the podcast form that lends itself to that. So, you know, you have to be very careful and cautious of it. But um, I, I think generally, I think the, the, the podcast genre has been really good, uh, a really good vehicle to do really sort of long form, hard hitting investigative journalism. And I think there's some really good stuff out there. I've recommended some on the, uh, on the Substack. So. Radleybalco.substack.com. <laughs> <laughs> Questions from the audience? Yes, ma'am. Mm -hmm. here in, in uh, Pennsylvania, and yet it seems that uh, um, no one is willing to look at it, look at your case until you serve a minimum of X number of years, and okay, just in case we were wrong, we'll look at it, but it has to be a decade or more. How do you... <laughs> yeah. Uh, can, there, you, can you repeat the question? Sure. So the, the question was, if you only have a year to protest your conviction, basically after you've exhausted your appeals, you have one year to bring what they call a post-conviction claim um, in most states, although it varies from state to state. Um, but that, it's, it's true here, I, I guess, and, and in most states. But a lot of times people won't look at or review, you review your conviction until you've been in prison for a long time. Um, this is just, I mean, this is one of my pet pet issues that um, I've been trying to write about for a long time, and it's, 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 it can be extremely complicated and convoluted and dizzyingly confusing. Um, so there's this federal law called EDPA that was passed after the Oklahoma City bombing, um, and basically what it does is it just defers to the states on all these issues. It, it makes federal review of a conviction, you know, almost impossible, and, and you have to sort of make your way through the state system first, and if you make any mistake along the way, that's a reason for the federal courts to not even consider your case. Um, and what it essentially does is it, um, and I'm not a lawyer, so it's always dangerous when I try to use legal terms, but, um, and John can correct me if I'm wrong, but I, I think there's a strong argument to be made that what EPA did was it, it, it's, a, it's an equal protection violation because it takes constitutional rights, which are supposed to be enforced at the federal level, and it devolves it down to the states. And so if you're convicted in Oklahoma, for example, um, you have to file your post-conviction petition at the same time you file your direct appeal. Well, the problem with that is one of the big things that you're supposed to do in post-conviction is review the performance of your attorney in your direct appeal. You can't do that if you file both of them at the same time. Um, in Michigan, I think, there's no, there is no deadline on when you can file uh, for post-conviction. So you can take 10 years investigating your case and then file, you know, eight years after you find new evidence. Um, in most states, it's a year which is, can be really difficult because not all the evidence is going to come out at once. So if you find a little bit of evidence and then a little bit more and then a little bit more, where does that one year cutoff begin? Um, and so in some cases, investigators and defense attorneys, they will 
sort of slow walk their investigations because they don't want to like sort of find evidence too far spaced about uh, spaced out because then they can't use it. Um, but in Arkansas, um, you have 60 days. You don't have a year. You have 60 days. Um, and for most of these people, once you've exhausted your direct appeal, uh, you don't have a pro bono attorney anymore. You don't get state representation. So. The whole purpose of post-conviction is to review your attorney's performance. You get act that's usually when you get access to the prosecutor's entire file. It's when you're supposed to hire, be able to hire your own investigators. And, and if it's a death penalty case, you see how this works, because every state that has a death penalty has an office that handles these cases, and they have, they're usually probably not well-funded enough, but they're usually funded. You see how these pan out. But the vast, vast, vast majority of people who get convicted in state court aren't death penalty cases, and they don't have lawyers, and so they have to negotiate this incredibly immense, complex, sort of Byzantine maze of rules and regulations on their own, you know, from jail or from prison. And, you know, if you take too long, like this guy in Louisiana, and you made the mistake of not subscribing to Reason Magazine, um, the courts are going to hold that against you later. Um, and so it's just, it's, I, the, the thing about EPA is it's, it, it's hard for me to sit up here and explain it in a way that doesn't where I'm just not joining on forever because it's so complicated and convoluted. But the thing to remember about it is it's that complicated and convoluted by design. If you go back and look at the congressional debate over EDPA, the whole point was to narrow, drastically limit the number of cases that get into federal court, state convictions that get into federal court by any means necessary, not by merit. They just wanted fewer cases. Um, an example I've always, I've always given is like, you know, let's say you're a publisher. Um, and you got some money to publish a bunch of books, and so you have put out a call for manuscripts, right? But you got way more manuscripts than you could ever need. Um, and so, so instead of sort of having editors review them and, and winnow them down by merit, you winnow them down by what font type people used, right? Or, um, you know, what kind of paper they used. Or um, it's just this, you know, it's, there's only a handful of defense attorneys in the country who are, who are know EDPA well enough that they can sort of handle these cases in a competent manner, and I don't think many defense attorneys would object to me saying that. Um, but that's by design, um, and the fewer, I mean, that's what the, the people who wrote this law had in mind. That's a very long answer, I'm sorry, but um, you, you hit one of my pet peeves. So. Well, <laughs> um, after hearing your breakdown, you're making a pretty strong argument that the last two years of law school are useless. <laughs> <laughs> I yes. appreciate that. Paul. So, Let's say the question again, if I get for the, so just sorry to keep interrupting with this, but the people online. Um, so the question is, um, we had a conversation yesterday about data in prosecutors' offices and the researchers saying that they're, they have pro projects they want to work on that are longer term, uh, and then a story will publish, you know, here in the Philadelphia Inquirer or the Philadelphia Tribune or wherever it might be, um, and, uh, and that will then distract the administration who will then say to the researchers, go get answers on this, and so they can't get to that other project. So is that the system working well, changing those priorities, not well? What are your thoughts there? Um, man, uh, I mean, I think I, I'm going to give another very, what's going to sound like a self-serving answer. I mean, I think, you know, it depends on the project, right? I mean, if, if the, the, the breaking story that requires kind of a new focus of resources and attention is something that um, deserves new resources and attention, then that's a good thing. <laughs> uh, if it's a distraction, if it's, you know, uh, a, a sensational kind of news story that uh, they're, they're just asking their researchers to find data for so they can construct some sort of response to get, you know, uh, because they have to respond, that's a bad thing. Um, I guess it's not, it's, the scenario isn't something that I think I would be comfortable giving a kind of categorical answer for, um, and I realize that's probably not satisfying, but um, yeah, I don't know. I mean, data, you know, as we all know, uh, criminal just, data in the criminal justice system is 
is bad and dirty and difficult, um, and there's not nearly enough of it. Um, and yeah, you know, as a journalist, it's hard to sort of sort through all of that sometimes, and it, you can see how easily it can be manipulated to, to advance various narratives. Um, and yeah, that's why I really kind of appreciate what the Quattrone Center is doing, because um, you know the, the the academics I respect are the academics who. Um, I mean, I respect a lot of academics, but I have particular respect for academics who, uh, you know, are willing to publish things that maybe challenge their own worldview or that ne don't necessarily uh, conform to one one side or the other. Um, you know, and the fact, the very fact that Quatron's having this event with, pros you know, that's a kind of prosecutor-themed event, um, I think is really interesting. I've actually learned a lot when I'm here. Um, so, um, yeah, I'm going to answer your question by not really answering it, but just flattering it. I mean, it depends on who the who the journalists are and who the stories are. <laughs> um, you know, I don't. I, I wouldn't want to necessarily make it more responsive to New York Post stories, for example. Um, uh, you know, I mean, I think there as a, as a journalist, there's always. I mean, and this is something I'm always challenging myself on. You know, anytime I get a good lead on a story and I'm writing a story, even if it's a really good story about one particular case, I always want to ask myself. You know, is there a risk of me writing this story and people thinking that this is uh, emblematic of something, and if, if that's what they're going to think, is that true, right? I mean, um, and you know, on the other side, this is the thing you always see with like bail reform, where they find the one you know handful of cases where somebody gets out on bail and goes on and commits another crime, and there's never any context about all the people who didn't go on to commit other crimes. Um, but I, you know, I think there's a danger of doing that on on um, the other side of these issues also, and um, so. Yeah, in terms of like what what policymakers should respond to, I th you know, I think they should respond to the the stories that uh, are backed by sufficient data that make a public policy response necessary or worthwhile. Uh, so we do, we'll do we'll do these last two questions and then we'll have to move on to the next one. So Sandy and then the gentleman in the back. All right, so as much as it's great to have even more resources and attention dedicated to wrongful convictions and accuracy in the system, narratives of error and wrongful conviction are pretty easy to take. No slow to you. Very straightforward. <laughs> oh, yeah. And I, whereas narratives of structural inequality and structural racism are a lot more complicated, one thing I really admire about your work is that you have such a broad appreciation of both. How can journalists and academics and criminal justice stakeholders at large better tell narratives of structural racism yeah. <laughs> sure. So, so the yeah the question is um, how can how can journalists and academics and others in the system work together more effectively to uh, construct persuasive narratives about the structural inequalities in the system? Uh, talk to people. Um, you know, uh, talk to the people who are on the ground. Um, I can tell you. You know, I I had been doing this for about 15 years until um, I was. Before the pandemic, I was going to write another book, and I still hope to write it, on uh, criminal defense. And part of that, I, I started shadowing um, public defenders around the country for a few days. And I mean, I learned, I learned more in those, you know, shadowing, uh, uh, um, those days that I shadowed those people than, you know, the last 10 years of you know, reporting and researching on this stuff, because to actually see it happening in front of you, um, there's no real substitute for that. So, you know, when I, when I talk to journalism students, I tell them, you know, one of the best things you can do to kind of get prepared for this job is go sit in court. Find your local court and just sit and watch what happens. Um, and talk to the people involved. Um, you know, it's, I, I think it would be great to shadow um, prosecutors, you know, for a day. I'd, I, I would be pleasantly, pleasantly surprised if I were invited to do that somewhere, um, but I would love to do that. Um, but, you know, just seeing that, I mean, some of the things I saw just kind of blew me away. I mean, one th well, just very quickly, one thing I saw uh, was in a rural criminal court in Kentucky, um, and I'd, I'd heard about the concept of constructive possession before, but this is the idea where if they pull you over in your car and they find pot and there are four people in the car and nobody claims it, they can charge all four of you with possession. And I had heard of it in that context of a car, but I didn't realize in Kentucky it's common to charge people with constructive conviction for being in a house where police find uh, drugs. And so there were people in there, there was a guy in there who, you know, he literally worked as a ditch digger, you know, barely should have getting by. And this was his fifth appearance in court on a constructive conviction charge because he was visiting his brother 
and the police raided at the time, and they found some meth that wasn't his, but he didn't want to sort of rat out his brother either. Um, and so now he's, you know, he's in danger of losing his job. And, uh, you know, I talked to several people who are in, in court on, on those kinds of charges. And, of course, you know, it is the people barely getting by who usually get, those, get hit with those kinds of charges. Um, but it's something I hadn't even, you know, thought about or considered. Um, and just – so, yeah, I think, I think you're right. You know, um, I, my wife and I have this – sort of dark joke about, oh, uh, you know, another innocence case, you know, like, because as, as John was saying, like, editors, they, you know, they get so many of them at this point that it's kind of, unless it's got really interesting facts or, or it distinguishes itself in some way, I mean, that's the sad point where we are kind of, where these cases are kind of uh, routine. Um, but it's harder to tell those stories. Again, that's why I thought the, the serial season two was so good, because it, it, it really, not only did it, like, narrate and describe the kind of systemic day-to-day -day injustices in a way that was like compelling and interesting and made you want to keep listening. Um, and that's kind of our challenge as journalists. I mean, that's with EDPA. I mean, I, I, one of the things I want, I mean, that, that, that law is probably one of the most destructive laws of the last 25 years in the realm of criminal justice. And, but it's really difficult to, to talk about just how it does that. And it takes kind of the, not only becoming familiar with the, the subject matter, but just hitting it over and over and over again from every possible angle. Um, I think that's a challenge for us as journalists to be able to do that accurately. All right, last question. Um, so I'm a practitioner and I represent people in fight under EDPA, um, including people on death row who were convicted in part on two of our analysis and forensic ballistics. Oh, uh, awesome. I don't want to reduce traffic on Rad without that stuff. <laughs> but can you give us any kind of preview of your report? Sure, yeah, I'd love to. Um, <laughs> Uh, Funny that you should ask about RadleyBalco.substack.com. <laughs> I, was, I was talking to John about this yesterday. Um, so basically, it, 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 it uses this, there's a recent uh, court decision in Chicago, in Cook County, uh, by a criminal court justice there, a judge there, who um, completely prohibited a ballistics analyst from, from testifying about being able to march, match a bullet to a gun. Um, it's the first ruling of its kind in the country. There have been other courts that have put limitations on what an analyst can say, but it's the first time a judge has ever barred one completely. And the reason why is because forensics firearms analysis, this matching of guns or shell casings uh, to bullets, um, isn't really backed by science. Uh, the, the, the scientific research that has been done has shown that it's not, we don't know that guns leave marks on bullets that are unique to that gun. We don't know how often certain distinguishing marks occur over the population of bullets, and even if both of those things were true, we don't know that forensic firearms analysts are very good at it, uh, even if it could be done. Um, and so what we're seeing is this, this, for a long time, forensics analysts were able to kind of dominate in court because science and criminal justice kind of took these divergent paths. Um, and so DNA comes along from the world of science, shows us that a lot of these fields are suspect scientifically. Science scientific community now gets interested and starts testing all these fields and now we're finding out you know a lot of these fields aren't what we thought they were they're not nearly as certain as we thought they were and the courts are trying to figure out what to do with all that because our courts rely on precedent and they rely on you know what other courts have said and how do they reconcile that with this new science how do you know when science has completely debunked a field and when it's only sort of cast it into doubt um, but I'll just give you one little tidbit from this story I told John about this yesterday because it, it after almost 20 years covering this stuff, to, it still managed to like surprise me and blow me away. So we know like in, in old areas of forensics like serology um, before DNA that, you know, sometimes analysts did what they call dry labbing where they would fake test results, right? Um, and in, there's examples from serology, Peter Neufeld and um, uh, uh, Brandon Garrett have looked at this and the, there's a, actually a great podcast called Admissible that gets into this. Um, we know that in some cases when blood type didn't match, when blood at the, of the, at the crime scene was a different type than either the defendant or the suspect, that suspect should have been excluded, right? The, the, they should have been excluded as the source of that blood. And instead, what would often happen is the analyst would say it was inconclusive, right? They wouldn't tell the defense that, that their client had been excluded. They would say, it's just inconclusive, I don't know. And sometimes they would come up with some excuse, like there was a bacterial infection in the blood, which is absurd, because bacterial infection wouldn't change one blood type to another blood type. Um, uh, but at least that was sort of recognized as something bad, right? Like it's, it was recognized as unethical, it was recognized as something that shouldn't be done. You know, maybe when, when it was discovered, um, state officials didn't do enough about it, they weren't concerned enough, they didn't do a deep enough investigation, but nobody thought that this was okay. So what I learned in researching this, this piece on ballistics is that the FBI crime lab and most state crime labs around the country uh, will not exclude a bullet as, come, as having come from a particular 
gun as a matter of policy. They will say, they will testify, that this bullet could have only been fired by this gun, so they'll implicate a suspect. They will not say that there's no way this bullet could have been fired by this particular gun. They will not exonerate a suspect. Now, that is absurd to me. Like, how can you claim to be sort of a fair-minded discipline that's only interested in the science when your results can only benefit the prosecution? Um, and that's a policy. That's not rogue analysts who are kind of doing this under the radar. That is the official written policy. Um, so I, I, that's, you know, one of the revelations in the piece that uh, kind of blew me away. But, um, yeah, hopefully it's going to go up um, next week sometime. So. And with that cliffhanger, uh, let me thank Radley Balco.